This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the £4 pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be gamble aware, over 18s only. Visit begambleaware.org. Be drink aware and for details and T's and C's, visit aspersnewcastle.co.uk. It's the True Faith Newcastle United podcast. Newcastle have gone and beaten Fulham by two goals to nil in the FA Cup fourth round on Saturday night in London. Massive win for Newcastle United. Massive win in the context of the season as we're heading to the fifth round for only the second time in about fucking 20 years (laughs) or some nonsense. I'm Alex. I'm joined by Cy, Ben and Charlotte to talk about what happened and why. Charlotte, I'll start with you. Newcastle have made history the first time since February 1999. We've gone away from home to a fellow Premier League side and beaten them in the FA Cup. Mm -hmm. It was a nice watch, wasn't it? It was a nice watch. Um, I mean, look, it wasn't the best performance, and I'm sure we'll get into that. But it was, um, it was, it was comfortable. Fulham didn't look very threatening. There were a couple of, you know, saves that Dubravka had to make, but uh, past that, they they couldn't create anything. Even when they got the ball off us, they couldn't turn it into anything. And you started feel like that sort of familiar that feeling that wasn't familiar, then got familiar last season, and then got unfamiliar again. Of of settling into the game and thinking, oh, actually, it's probably all right, isn't it? Like this is this is all right. So, really positive to have gone to a fellow Premier League side because obviously we've 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 played uh, the last round um, was against a Championship side and was really more of a training session. And this one was it's it's it, we were sort of lamenting oh, it's Premier League opposition, but actually in the grand scheme of things, given our December form, it's nice to have gone there and for that to have been reasonably comfortable and um and obviously progressing in the cup which keeps the season alive for many is uh, is is massively important so yes it was a very nice very nice evening i have some concerns about the performance but i'll hold on to those for now <laughs> because i agree with everything you just said about he's back um, <laughs> <laughs> um yes out. well speaking of bruce yeah all this uh, stuff about um it's been 17 years or something since we've been in the fifth round everyone forgets that bruce got to the fifth round because it was such a non-event that it basically (laughs) doesn't count i i understand totally forgotten yeah even tilsy last night didn't remember like it's just ridiculous (laughs) like it didn't it didn't count because we didn't turn it at all with no uh with no with no supporters there but yeah um it it is a big deal it's it's a big deal getting the fifth round especially in the context of this season you know out the league cup out the champions league League campaign not going so well. The FA Cup is a real big thing for us this season. I think um, you have to beat what's in front of you and beating Fulham, who are a mid-table Premier League side, 2-0 away on paper. That's a great result. Fulham, who've beaten Arsenal at home in recent weeks. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's not an easy ground to go to, albeit I don't think Fulham were particularly good, nor do I think we were particularly good, but that's the kind of job that we haven't been doing this season. Winning dirty, winning when you're not playing well. So I'm really pleased with the result, really pleased that we're going into the hat for the draw, which is... Two o'clock today, Sunday. No, it's after for the match. It's after, it's just, the, after the match. Bizarre. Yeah, four-ish. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can't wait for the draw. It's really exciting, isn't it, being in the FA Cup draw like and actually it meaning something? Yeah, no, um, <clears throat> I agree. I think, um, I mean, that, that was a Fulham side that were able to rotate. Obviously, they arrested some of the, the guys that normally come in. Obviously, we didn't really have any options to, to do that, obviously, especially with, with certain players out. Um, and I think they, they handled that well. I mean, obviously, when they made their subs, I don't think... They looked any more of a threat. We we dealt with kind of everything that they, they threw at us, and um, it was just a really professional performance. I mean, we'll we'll go into kind of the breakdown of of maybe where we we think we should have been better, but I think we handled what they threw at us without having to kind of exert too much energy into that game. Um, obviously, we saw Tino and uh, <laughs> like to Richie come on right at the death, but um, it just felt a, a comfortable game that could have been a, a potential banana skin, as, as you say, a, a Premier League side. Um, away from home that, that it's never going to be easy it's an extra game um, obviously that we, we, it, it's another one where we, we're hoping for rests and, and yes we've had a kind of a week to build up to this but um, it was yeah potentially a game that, that we could have come and stuck in but we didn't um, two of the local lads got the goals again the cup the cup lads as we need to start calling <laughs> them. Um, and uh, yeah it was uh, it was a good win it was a great win. Uh, it was a, I don't want to call it a season revitalizing win. And, but in terms of, like you said, Charlotte, the 
it, it, it keeps an, an added layer of interest in the season beyond trying to get seventh or maybe sixth, depending on how the next couple of weeks go and the last few days of the transfer window. Actually, really nice after all the conversations on this podcast in particular, but lots of conversations between lots of fans and also the attention of the general media to get away from spreadsheets, to get away from why Newcastle can't spend money and just, just play a football mm. match and, and win it relatively comfortably. In fact, no, I'll say it comfortably. I thought uh, we'll talk about the performance and the negativity around it in a bit, but I, I thought it, in terms of the end of that fixture, it was incredibly comfortable. And if you're going away from home to, let's face it, a good Premier League home side, I think following the ninth best team at home in the league so far, six Premier League home wins already by January. This is not a, a, a joke of a side. This is not a place that's easy to go. Like Sai, you said, Arsenal went there and found out it was difficult. Liverpool really struggled there in spells on Wednesday. So Newcastle have gone there uh, with the players we've got missing. Um, and we've won. We've won We've won fairly comfortably. And I feel like in terms of the narrative of the season, it's now uh, a good few weeks before Newca- uh, since Newcastle were put in a, what I would just call a bad performance. They were, mm. they were good at Sunderland. Uh, they were good at, uh, you know, there were aspects of the performance that were much better against Manchester City. And now this is, this is also a good performance and a good win. So... Uh, it's it's actually been a, a, a dreadful couple of months, hasn't it? Really, since the end of November, really, really bad. Uh, so to go and, and just be able to a little bit like the Sunderland game, but without all the emotion, to go and just kind of control a game at least at, at one up and beyond, and and enjoy that win, whether you were at the game in a raucous away end or you were just watching uh, around the country, around the world. I feel like we've been owed that a little bit by the team to, to, to be able to go into a big game, and that was a big game for the reasons we've articulated, and get the win. It's um, it's incredibly pleasing, and it should be something for the lads to take into Villa, at least. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that was a performance that screams we're going to go to Aston Villa and get someone, but didn't have to, because all you've got to actually do in that fixture is beat Fulham, or get a replay at least, and we did that. You shouldn't be worrying too much about the next fixture, in my opinion, when you've got a job to do, and they did it. And like you said, Sai, the draw becomes incredibly tantalizing, doesn't it? And Ben, I mean, I think everyone points to a sixth tier side of the dream, but then also people seem to think this is Newcastle United season 23-24. Somehow we'll draw Bayern Munich <laughs> in this one. <laughs> yeah, who, who do you want, mate? What, what? That's where my money is. Um, I mean, we've, we've just been talking about that. Anyone at home, I think we've, we've, we've already beaten Man City at home this season. We've already battered Liverpool at home. Obviously didn't get the result, but we owe them. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, I don't care any of them. Um, but yeah, it would be um, just a <laughs> for, for the fixture congestion that we've, we've had this season and stuff. Like that, it would be nice to get a, a nice, comfortable, like avoided prem team home game. But um, at the same time, I, I couldn't really care less. I think it would be anyone at home, just not away, please. Yeah, agreed. Um, I, really, I want it to be an easy game. I want it to be. Maidstone, which you know, I don't want to disrespect Maidstone, but no, they don't, their fans don't listen, so slag, oh. slag them off. <laughs> they're, they're fucking shit. No, um, I don't watch Maidstone because I don't really watch the National League South. Um, and I and I looked at their next game, and it's against a team called Punjab United, which I'd never heard of, <laughs> and it's in the like Kent Boys Cup or something, <laughs> which which I'd never heard of. Um, so like it's a. Uh, you know, that's a game that feels like we should win it. But it is more important that the um, the game is at home. We deserve it. We've we've done a lot of, um, our fans have done a lot of traveling. Obviously, we weren't there, but they were absolutely class last night. Incredibly loud on the TV. It was, it was mint. But we, I just want us to be at home. I want the, I want us not to have to travel, the team not to have to travel. I want a, a, a massively raucous St. James's Park and 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 that's what's important to me. I think we could do over any team really if that's the circumstance, but ideally Maidstone. So let's let's have that. But then I think like you know, Luton won. That would be fine. Teams like that. Yeah, we're gonna have to knock somebody out on the way to the final. Aren't we? I'd rather play uh, a Man City or a Liverpool at home in one of the earlier mm. rounds than have to play them at Wembley. Like honestly, I think we'd, we'd have a better chance at home. Um, I'm not saying we can't beat those in a neutral one-off fixture. I think we can beat anyone if we turn up. But I'd rather play one of them, knock them out. Maybe let Arsenal play another one of them. Knock, yeah, we need some of these teams to knock each other out as well. We don't want to play every one of those on the mm-hmm. way to the final. But yeah, I, I'm confident that at St. James's Park, with the way the fixtures are now and the fact that the fifth round is just a Saturday fixture, isn't it? It's not a midweek. There's no fixture crunch around it. We can we can turn up against anybody. So um, I think it comes too early for the Champions League games. So uh, it, playing one of those top sides won't be affected by that. But 
Um, yeah, I, I, I'm confident we can beat anybody after, uh, surprisingly, after last night's pretty average performance from us. <laughs> I've suddenly got my, my mojo back about Newcastle. The but magic yeah. of the cup. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, at the time of recording, this, uh, there's still some games to be played, but you, mm. you know, you're looking at Chelsea or Villa, you know, you want them, either of them at home. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday or Coventry, uh, Bristol or Forest, Man City, and Maidstone, Leeds or Plymouth, Leicester, Brighton, Luton, and then whatever, you know, whoever gets through in the, the games today. There's still plenty of bad sides, and there's the point I'm yeah. making. There's mm-hmm. still a lot of sides you'd expect to be home and away. We are due a, a generous cup draw. And, you know, some of you might be listening or watching thinking, well, we had those against Sheffield Wednesday and Cambridge and they didn't go well. So give us as hard as they come, even though we haven't got past. Well, we have got past a few this season. actually. So, yeah, it's um, it's just really exciting and, and kind of cup draws in football are things that can't they just can't be replicated in any other part of football. If you're not in them regularly, like we haven't been for so many years, you, you forget that feeling. You forget that at four o'clock today or half four, five o'clock, whenever the draw is actually made what it will feel like to be you know to be what waiting for your team name to come up the hat and of course we had it against Sunderland where that draw became the big news for like a month so you can't wait and also with my horrid modern football fan profit and sustainability rules hat on you know, you know another million quid from a home game wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't go amiss would it if we <laughs> if we could sell all the corporate seats and <laughs> shit like that uh, we need the money we need the cash uh, so yeah, home game please against anyone. I agree with pretty much the consensus here is that we, we beat anyone at home or we've got a good chance anyway. Not so sure about away from home. It was good to finally actually win an away game against a team that wasn't uh, called Sheffield United or Manchester United, both of whom are not good uh, at the minute, even though Manuel Bovers in the league. So I'll come to you first then, mate. You've already articulated that you think that despite the result being excellent, maybe the performance wasn't, which is something that particularly at half time, but also a little bit at full time, people were shouting on social media. So the floor is yours. <laughs> I wasn't one of those. I didn't, I didn't go to social media to shout. I was with you guys enjoying the fact that we got shouting. through the fifth round. <laughs> yeah, um, just shout as a person. <laughs> you know, on, on paper, another um, clean sheet, another away from home win over a Premier League opposition. That's good. Why can we only win these games like 2-0? Against, against Fulham. Yeah, 2-0, 3-0. Yeah, Fulham, but 2-0, 3-0 and 8-0 have been our three away wins this season. Like, why can't we just win a scruffy 2-1 or, or I'll interrupt you there because I was going to make this point, but you brought it up early. You, you, it's a great point because if you look at our like, last six away wins, it's um, Southampton 4 1, Leicester 3 0, <laughs> uh, Everton 4 1, West Ham 5 1. There was Brentford 2 1 in there, but it was like a hero comeback, unbelievable mm. performance turnaround, and Sheffield United 8 0. That's not normal. Like, like <laughs> either get beat or smash teams. How about, as we got, just a nice, compact, ride your look at times away win? That's that's what winning. You're not going to win away from home often if you've got to fucking beat teams by four and five. So it's actually, I think, it's a massive positive to go away and just just like just win, keep a clean sheet. Yeah, keep has to make a couple of saves. Yeah, if they take their chances, they might they might get something in the game. But they didn't. We did. On to the next one. Back to you. Yeah. So I said to all of you guys as as the game finished that if we play like that against Villa on Tuesday, we'll get absolutely spanked. And I, I think that's true. I think if we, especially uh, in the first half before we scored, and maybe the start of the second half as well, um, we were just giving the ball away. We were stuck in our own half for such long periods that if you do that with a good side like Aston Villa, they'll punish you. Now we got away with it with Fulham for, to an extent because no matter how many times we gave them the ball. We kind of got ourselves back in shape. You know, there's some positive aspects of what we were doing, which was give. Them, it's like we're trying to teach ourselves what to do if, if they get the ball back loads in our own half. Um, so yeah, but, uh, Bruno's probably one of the players that we'll, we'll come back to because he was he was his passing was off. Uh, every time we play, try to play it out, a Fulham player had the ball by the time we got to the halfway line, um, and they were back at us and they were putting lots of crosses in. And we dealt with that really well. I thought defensively we were excellent, but I thought in terms of the way we like to play, the way we like to play out, it was a bit worrying, and we didn't really get out of our half. A great deal in this game we didn't attack much we didn't we didn't go down either side we got, we got gordon away a couple of times we got murphy away a couple of times but realistically we spent an awful lot of that game in our own half and that's fine if you beat fulham 2-0 and fulham aren't good enough to do anything with that but against better sides we'll get punished that said we, we we've been saying it for ages why can't we just win dirty a little bit you know mm. I'm, I'm quite happy that we've we've done that and kind of taught ourselves to keep a clean sheet in that situation where we're kind of conceding a lot of possession I think we'll approach the Villa game differently, and I think we have to. It's it's a very different prospect. You know, Fulham are. We've we've said they're quite good, but they're like 13th in the league. You know, they're they're not a, they're not a great side this season. 
And we've needed to just get some scruffy wins over teams in the bottom half. And we've got lots of bottom half teams to play in the second half of the season away from home. That kind of performance and result is absolutely fine. I'm just a little bit worried against better sides that if we turn up and play so sloppily for periods, we're in real trouble. And yeah, I think some of our key players weren't at it last night. But I suppose you can turn that into positive and try not to be too negative here. You can turn that into positive and say, even with Bruno um, Botman and uh, Isaac being quite quiet or giving the ball away a lot, um, we still won 2-0. So you've, you've got to see that as a good thing, I suppose. You know, playing quite poorly and, and winning the game is, is a good thing. Uh, but yeah, I was a little bit worried about about after two weeks of prep, we were very, very sloppy. It's almost like the lads had been given a proper, proper holiday this time instead of <laughs> two weeks of training. We were saying it, weren't we? Like Bruno looks like he's actually just been at Disneyland and eating a load of ice cream. So he was a bit, bit he sluggish did. first half. He got better as the game went on and, and so did most of those players. But yeah, early on I was thinking, what the hell is this? What's what's going on? But I don't know. That's that's my negative bit said. I think um, he literally did do that, didn't he? And Gordon went to Brooklyn and watched the basketball, but he actually looked he looked like he was rested. I think we weren't great, but I also think I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and put a positive spin on on size negative. Um, firstly, you know you mentioned Isaac there, and, and I do just think like you sort of mentioned that he wasn't firing on all cylinders. I think Isaac was incredibly isolated yesterday because of the way, the, how deep the midfield were mm. and 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 Bruno not kind of not being able to move the ball up the pitch. I don't think Isaac himself necessarily had a bad game. I'm not, I'm not trying to like, like defend Alexander no, no, Isaac, I, I but, I, but, I, but I, yeah, it, it was it was just all, all like compact, wasn't I, it? I, I used the word quiet specifically yeah, yeah, for Isaac because right, you're yeah. right. When he was on the ball, he was still very good. But, yeah. Mm. It, and, and you're right, that's the sort of thing we need to work out when we're playing Villa, like 100%, because they will just exploit that a million times over. They're a much better side than Fulham. But I also kind of think we knew that Fulham aren't that good of a side. We knew that they potentially aren't going to create lots. And we, we also, we, we had a lot of the possession, but I, I think we just, we were allowed to <laughs> relax a little bit in a game like that. We We are knackered. We are still getting back into fitness. We are still getting back into kind of the swing of, of playing well and 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 I do believe that the second half of the season is going to be better for us we're, we're playing pretty much one game a, a week obviously we've got this the cup ties coming in but they're not it's not like the congestion congestion fixture congestion <laughs> that we had I'm just making it words um that we had in the run-up to the new year so I kind of think maybe it was maybe it was on purpose maybe it was just a it's okay like don't don't beat yourselves up about you know bad passing or or losing the ball because Fulham aren't that good and you're going to be okay and you did sort of see and we'll talk about individuals but you did see players like Dan Byrne make kind of some sloppy passes in the first half and then get better in the second half and I think that that's quite encouraging for me I suppose um Oh, yeah, thinking about the way we kind of approached the game, maybe there was some intention to it because you're right, we've got quite a slow defence. So they've got to play quite deep. Um, there was definitely, a, and, and I, I observed this twice, it might have happened more, but I picked up on it twice, where our three midfielders, when we did get the ball out of our half, they'd get to the halfway line and all three would stop. It's like they were being told, don't go past the halfway line. Do not leave that massive gap yeah. between defence yeah. and midfield. It was There was an active attempt to do that now that that's got to be tackled that's got to be instructed because uh, we're thinking why aren't we getting ourselves at the pitch why are we playing this whole game in our own half but it's mm-hmm. almost like we're practicing something and or playing that way deliberately so as to keep the team quite compact and then rely on gordon isaac and murphy with their pace to to do the rest you know to, to basically away. basically operate in their half the rest of the lads just going to stay compact not leave any big gaps so in that sense and it did force Fulham, or we, although we gave them a lot of the ball, all they really had was going out wide and pinging in loads of crosses. So maybe there was some intention to that. I'll give them that. And I think it meant Bruno played quite deep. It, it kind of reminded us that Bruno isn't really a six because Bruno picking up the ball on the edge of his own box and the, the times he gives it away can be really costly because you're giving it away to a Fulham player in, in our half. But there definitely seemed like there was some logic to what we're doing. I'm not saying we played badly and it was kind of like they weren't following instructions. There was something there. But I don't know, is that going to work against Villa? I'm not so sure. Yeah, agreed. I think, the, I mean, just quickly on that, I, I think the point is, is, I mean, how many times have we been caught on counter-attacks this season? I mean, yeah. even games yeah. at home, I mean, we talked about it last night about how many times have we conceded where we've been completely in control of games, we've been on on, on top, and then we've we've conceded a goal right at the death of the first half or something like that for basically a break mm-hmm. breakaway goals. Well, that tactic there was clear that they were trying to avoid that happening where yeah. the, the defence get overrun, so... Um, I think you're right there. It was more tactical. Um, 
decision to say, actually, we believe our front three are good enough to break them down. And also it's, it's inviting them onto you. So it's kind of what, what our front three strive on is space and, and being one-on-one -on -one basically. And that was trying to kind of encourage that. So I, I, I agree. I think that was definitely a, a tactical decision to do that. And, um, and was trying to get us in a kind of a positive situation. I mean, I think for me, yeah, it wasn't the cleanest performance. I think um, it highlighted that our midfield at the minute, not to be too critical, just isn't probably kind of a, a top half Premier League side in terms of, it doesn't reflect where we should be as a, a club, but ultimately we're playing with like our seventh and eighth choice centre mids, in my um, opinion anyway. Um, and I think how many midfielders we got here? Yeah. <laughs> well, loads. He's, he's choosing injured. two youth players ahead of Longstaff in that analogy. There, <laughs> <laughs> don't need to name them all. No, we're not going to do it. But there's there's plenty of people. Um, but uh, the, the the point I want to make was I, I think defensively. I mean, you, you've got to look at a clean sheet away from home when we've we've not been great is, is a massive positive. I think these are all right in terms of the chances we gave them. A lot of it was our own um, making in terms of sloppy passes. But you, you could see that they would they, basically both teams were kind of trying to play the same way and were getting themselves into trouble. I mean, we we won the ball in their final third from their defence as many times as they did it to us. So it wasn't as if it was all kind of one-way traffic. Mm. Um, I think you're right, Si, that in terms of the chances that they created, there were crosses from from wide where they weren't getting anywhere near them, really. I mean, they, they could have been dangerous crosses, but ultimately they didn't have the players on the pitch capable of kind of yeah. um, taking advantage of that. So... I think that was another time. We're we're a tall side. I mean, Botman and Shaw and, and Byrne in, in in the box, like you shouldn't be winning many headers. So that that plays into our strength. So I'm 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 happy with that. Uh, kind of conceding that if we're going to concede chances, um, we're best equipped to deal with that. And I think um I mean the the, the playing out, there was a number of times where yes, we we give the ball away, but when we didn't, like the ball Shaw was playing where he'd kind of play like a, a cross ball, <laughs> whoever if if it got there. The play was just in loads of space and it just allowed us to, to, to hit them on the counter-attack. And that was probably the frustration for me was there was a couple of times where um, we probably should have slid Isak in. I think in the back, mm. he, he was in basically in foot races with two slower defenders. I mean, Tim Ream, for folks' sake, um, <laughs> just put the ball in space for him. Um, and it's one of the, the problems I think we've had all season is that how do we get Isak? I've, I've complained, I think, on this on this podcast before about we don't play at Isak strengths. Um, and it's still something we need to get better at, but I suppose you need the individuals Mid to be able to make those passes. You've yeah. got to have the ability to thread a ball through a, a kind of a three or four yard gap. And it, it's it's kind of the risk reward element of it as well. I mean, there's plenty of times where they tried it and it got cut or whatever, but um, I think there was, there was plenty of things in there that they'll be pleased with more from the defensive side point. Obviously it was away from home. It was a, was a difficult fixture. And we've, as you say, I, I can't really remember Dubravka making a save where I thought bloody hell like that could have been like a game changing moment or something like that so um, yes on in possession not our best but we got the job done but defensively and off the ball I thought we were really good you did miss the start of the game because <laughs> there was one <laughs> really good save from Debrafka in the first 10 but other than that you're yeah. right two really big things for me that I think the team will take a lot from and some small things but two big things and I think in terms of that kind of Bruno midfield performance there's a review podcast on Patreon out later on they'll, they'll probably go into more detail on it and that's the whole purpose of that podcast but number one I feel like what we've been bad at doing this season away from home is riding out tough periods because away from home in the Premier League you, you're always going to get them so Luton had like a strong 20 minutes in the score against us um, I could go through quite a few games where you think you've just kind of got to survive these moments and that's all right so like Dubravka pulls out two smart saves at nil nil, and Fulham have a shot that goes just wide. Newcastle aren't playing great by any means, and like you said, there's a sloppiness there. But that's okay because now we look back at this fixture and think, well, they got through that, and then they scored. And like that's li mm. literally the template of how to win away from home. I almost feel like this side, and I'm talking about the players here potentially rather than just fans, feel like they have to be so dominant, they have to suffocate teams, they have to be all over teams to to get something from the game, and it's just not sustainable at this level and you know I think a, a good thing I saw on social media was if Liverpool or Man City or, or whoever or particularly someone like Man United or Chelsea had, had gone to Fulham and put in that performance and won there'd be no qualms about it yeah. mm -hmm. I don't think their fan bases would be saying oh, uh, well, we won but it was hopeless it was like no no 
winning away from home in the Premier League or against the Premier League side is really difficult. That's why so few teams do it regularly. You're going to have spells in games where you've just got to get through it. And we've been bad at that with Spurs away. You know, Spurs start um, very strong and coming at the game after about 10 minutes. And we just we just didn't get through it. Like the goal was always coming. We didn't have a way to slow the game down. We didn't have a way to get out. We didn't have a way to, uh, at that moment, the goalkeeper to make some saves because Debraca was poor when he first came back into the team. He's got much better since. So really promising just to ride out some tough stuff mm. and earn the rewards. That's what the team has to do more of. And if we're going to get anything at somewhere like Aston Villa, there's going to be parts of that game where the goal is under attack. We're just, we're just going to have to get through it. No point collectively beating ourselves up saying, oh, well, we're, we're one, but we're hopeless. We're one, but we didn't deserve it. Fine. I'm absolutely fine with that, particularly away from home. We're going to pick up points. We're going to pick up wins when the other team feel a bit hard done by, by the scoreline. It's okay. More of it, please. The other thing is we didn't see the slow retreat toward our own goal. Now, the second goal might have a big part of that. But even at 2-0, I felt like, A, we retained more of a threat on the bit of break than we had done in previous games. And B, we just didn't get as deep. Yeah, Fulham pressured us as they're going to do. But it wasn't like all, like we didn't have like eight outfield players constantly camped in or just outside the penalty area. Now, maybe you would hope... That's a tactical thing they've worked on in the time off. Maybe it's because of the time off. Maybe it's because Fulham aren't PSG or AC Milan or any of those sides, Chelsea even, you know, so that, that there is a, a gap in the opposition quality potentially. But it's just in terms of my fears going into this fixture, it was if we're in the lead on 60, what do we do? Or we're just going to see more of the same kind of capitulation, edge of the box, try and score if you can football. Instead, we saw far more robust, far more, far more positive defensive performance. And I think Shaw, well, the whole back four, but I think Shaw and Botman in particular. I mean, Sai, you, you picked out Botman early. He's not having a great game. I thought he was excellent defensively. Um, oh, yeah. I was uh, talking about players playing the ball out. Okay. Defensively, we were excellent. I yeah. think everyone was. And mm. I think I think Botman's ability to kind of snuff out those balls in behind and his recovery pace and the excellence of his sliding tackles just meant that wasn't an option for them. Whereas previously against Newcastle, they've been, because they've been so slow at the back with Lascelles and Shaw in particular in there, um, it just looked very comfortable in the end. And it looks very comfortable because we aren't too deep, because even though we allow some chances on the goal, most of them are from crosses or out, or out wide because the centre of the pitch was so compact and solid. So I actually think is in terms of run-of-the-mill away wins, go if you take away the context of the fixture and the competition it was almost a perfect away performance in the second half yeah there's loads of things they want to improve on on and off the ball there's loads of players who could play better there's going to be more of a, a threat from the bench and a chance to change things up but i am quite enthused by the overall performance and not just the result so let's get into some of the individual performances from this one so i think sean longstaff gets a goal a big goal at that, the opening goal um thoughts well, I mean, he was, he was absolutely brilliant, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I don't even think he was, you know, at, at his best, but he was definitely much, much closer to it. I think he's a player in particular, and, and there's lots of others in this in this category who've lacked confidence in recent weeks. They've looked a bit burnt out. They've looked like they're just not themselves. We all know Longstaff technically isn't the best footballer we have, and, you know, he's always going to miss chances, and um, his passing range varies. Some weeks he's brilliant, other weeks he's, he's a bit sloppy, and he was definitely one of the players... He just couldn't seem to find any Castle player in the first 20 minutes. That said, the stuff you get out of Sean Longstaff, especially away from home and especially at home against good sides, we saw that yesterday. We saw him running and harrying players. I mean, he doesn't put in a lot of tackles, <laughs> but he does find himself in the right position. So every time we decided to give Fulham the ball cheaply, Longstaff was the first one back in position, back in the face of Fulham players, making it hard for them, forcing them wide and kind of doing all the stuff he's good at. I think he also was part of that three-man midfield. They seem to have a lot more cohesion, a lot more shape. And um, if they were moving forward, they were moving forward as a unit. If they were retreating, they were retreating as a unit. I think it was a, a much more complete performance from him. And um, yes, Ben, he might have kicked the ball out of play once or twice in the first half. But as the game went on, as he got his goal, very well taken goal, on his left foot as well, um, he just seemed to get his confidence back and seemed to be a lot more sure of himself and making the right decisions and kind of not... I would say he's been guilty of bottling it a little bit in recent weeks. And I think Miley's the same. I think his confidence dropped a little bit, um, whereby they're just not trying anything. They're just getting the ball and panicking and either going to Bruno two yards away or going back. And I thought Longstaff, at least a little bit yesterday, was putting his foot on the ball, trying to find stuff, hanging on the ball, winning free kicks, and just doing a lot more of the of the midfield job that he's capable of doing uh, with with his with his level of ability. And um, yeah, when, when Bruno 
didn't have his best game. I thought Longstaff and Miley um, stood out a bit more. Um, so yeah, I thought Longstaff way, way more like the Longstaff we got last season, who was so important to us getting through games like this, seeing out games, winning 2-0, keeping a clean sheet and kind of not ending up just throwing it away the, w- the way we have so many times this season. I, th- I think the, the goal um, definitely kind of changed his his um, impact on the game. You, you could see him growing confident. Mm. It was a great taking goal as well. I mean, it's a huge moment in the game, obviously, to take the lead. Um, it's a bit of a scrappy one. Obviously, it, we had the VAR check for the, the handball and stuff, but it, it's a great finish, like left-footed as well. Um, really good goal. And you could see, I think you're right, you could see his confidence growing in the game. I think as well it was a game that suited his um, skill set in terms of we didn't have a huge amount of the ball, mm. especially in that second half. So it played into his kind of strengths that um, it's kind of the, the recovering, getting into position, kind of staying. And I think that's one, that the point you made about the cohesion, the, the mid three was much better in this game um, than we've seen. I think too many times um, they, they're getting caught like almost dog legged and one of them pushes and, and then kind of teams can play through them and, mm. and, and they're too easily onto our back four in other games. Whereas, um, you already kind of made the point uh, before now, I think as well. Um, they weren't all bombing forward, or they, there was a lot better communication between the three of them to to kind of sit in and, and actually yeah. not put ourselves like not hurt ourselves basically. And I think it was a much cleaner performance in terms of that. Um, you're right. I think he, it, there, there was. I mean, I, I'm, I'm joking aside. There were, were some slot. There was a bit of sloppiness in that in that first half, but I think it got, as I say, it got much better and cleaner. And I think that's. Definitely a performance that um, the, the, the the unit, the three of them, can kind of build on. Um, it's been kind of probably one of the key weaknesses I've, I've kind of been um, pointing out recently where I, I just think we've been overrunning midfield too many times. We didn't get that yesterday, even though Fulham had a lot of, um, a lot of the ball, especially at that, that kind of first 15, 20 minutes after the half. Um, we we kind of let them have that, and it was kind of like, right, we'll come on and see if he can break it down, and they couldn't. So... Um, You've got to look at the positives. I think his energy was back, and yeah, you, you can't criticise a player when he's, he's he scored a goal and and um, contributed to a, a massive away win. And we haven't had too many of those, um, so let's hope we can get a few more. I don't know whether the goal was the catalyst for this for this general good performance. The things I'm going to talk about, but it can't have hurt him. I thought the best thing about Longstaff yesterday was just he he, he was he was. He was just willing to take some risks and mm. try and win the ball. Yeah. I looked at a stat of Longstaff and Murray this season, and they both make, on average, less than two tackles and less than two interceptions a game, which is is disastrous. For me, it, it is. <laughs> the, the stats are absolutely horrific. For no, Dodger, these are two of the greatest players to ever <laughs> tread the. M- Miley's got. Miley's, I'm not going to criticize him because child, but. Look, that's not Longstaff. Like look, those stats for Longstaff this season are not him. It, mm. because, because he's not as um, as efficient or or good on the ball as a lot of Premier League midfielders. He makes up for that by being effective at what he does, and that's like you say, so getting back in position, pressing teams, winning the ball back, hassling players, making them go backwards, making them do things they don't want to do. Man City are a very good team, and Rodri's a very good player, but it'll probably haunt me for a long time for that De Bruyne equaliser where Longstaff just kind of escorts him across the pitch and allows him <laughs> to make a pass through our, our midfield. That's just It's just not him. And I, th- I thought yesterday for, he was a real thorn in Fulham's side. He was constantly in their face. He was constantly hassling them. Even if he wasn't making tackles, he was making them go backwards or he was making mm. them make passes they didn't want to make to retain possession. That's what we need to see more of him because when he loses that, he's, he's kind of a passenger in games, particularly if his confidence has dropped a little bit because of the general malaise of the team or his own poor form so really positive and bodes well for the rest of the season in fact if he's able to return to that kind of form I think it's also kind of important that Howe is now settled on Miley while he's still in the team having to play left side so that mm. long staff plays right and it's harsh on Miley because he's playing in a, a team he shouldn't really be playing and certainly the, the number of fixtures he's had to play in the number of minutes he's had to put in but he's also playing wrong side of the midfield whereas before I think Howe's often kind of had to move long staff and it just hasn't mm. worked and we'll talk about Miley in a little bit, in fact. But, uh, you know, really positive yesterday for, for Sean Longstaff, for me. Dan Byrne, Charlotte, you impressed? Yeah, Dan Byrne, player of the match, um, officially. Emirates player of the match. Um, I just, what I was really impressed with, with Dan Byrne yesterday, was obviously he scored, scored the uh, second goal. And that's really important. And really nice goal from a set piece, just in the right place, right time, and, and capitalised on that. 
loads of humility after the game as well. It was like, normally I'd have missed that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> people literally in front of an open goal. <laughs> Which I just, I just love him. But it's the, it's for me that, um, and, and it's true of lots of players and it's true of long stuff as well. I mean, you've kind of touched on it, is that Dan Byrne made a few mistakes in the first half, particularly the first half of the first half, um, where, you know, players were kind of making some wrong passes or um, in particular, he was making some bad passes or just you know, passing straight to Fulham. And I sort of thought, oh, for fuck's sake, like, this is just going to, I know how this is going to go. We've seen this performance. But instead of losing his head, instead of, like, panicking, he really, really calmed down. And I I, I think that's a really, I know he's, a, he's an older player, but I, I think he has a tendency to lose his head a little bit or get sort of swept up in it. And yesterday he he just didn't. He he was he was really measured, particularly after that long staff goal. I think going in front, and I think Howe said it after the game, going in front really calmed the players down. The second half was an excellent performance in context of the first half, which was a little bit more scrappy. Still wasn't excellent overall. Um and um and I just thought he was he was just brilliant yesterday and you know, we've we've also talked about how good we were defensively. We're, we we are a tall side, and a lot of their um, opportunities were coming in from these crosses. And he was just, you know, he and Sven Botman were, were were very very good together yesterday, getting getting rid of those. He also made some excellent tackles. He 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 stopped Fulham in their tracks several times, and I just thought like that's the damn burn that we haven't seen for quite a long time. He he, he was rushed back from injury, I think, and, and we saw him at one point land land on him on his on his back, sort of bum back, exactly what happened against Arsenal and broke his back in two places. But there's just this willingness and this this ability that's just it's just back, I think, with Dan Byrne. He's not the fastest player. He's is not every game's gonna be his game, but last night was his game and I thought it was excellent. Martin Dubravka, sorry. Um, yeah, it, well, certainly in the first 20 minutes, we really needed him. But um, considering all the conversations when Nick Pope got injured, we're, oh, we're going to have to buy a keeper now as well in January. I think we've put that question to bed. Um, his first couple of games um, over the Christmas period were a bit suspect. And then you had the Liverpool game. And he was absolutely excellent. Uh, you know, kept that respectable when it could have been really, really embarrassing. He was really good. Sunderland made two or three really good saves again against Man City. And again, yesterday, the, the two or three saves he had to make, he, he made them really well. And he seems to be growing in confidence. He seems to be um, distribution wise still okay. Like, he's no better than Pope uh, distribution wise, in my opinion. And he's probably no better than Pope as a goalkeeper. But he's certainly given a run for his money in terms of his shot stopping. He's he's keeping everything out. He's he's not letting anything easy in. Um, he's you know he's, he is he is claiming things, and he's kind of his defenders now seem to trust him, which yeah. didn't seem to be the case when he first came at the team. There seemed to be a lot of confusion a lot of old, uh, 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 being unsure whereas they seem to know how to play with them they, they they trust each other they know when to go back they know when to um be available and yeah i i was i was really impressed with them and i'm really pleased that we can kind of park that whole goalkeeper conversation because the transfer window is already becoming as, as difficult as, as as it could have been without needing to think about whether we need a goalkeeper so that's that's nice and yeah it was, it was um as part of that back five which which kept a very good clean sheet i thought they all seemed to be gelling again and that's really really encouraging going into whatever fixtures are about to come i think that's a really important point because i think when you look at um the some of the the games that we've we've given sloppy goals away this season like you, you can see that they're starting to get comfortable with each other and it's starting to become a proper unit where they're, they're just used to playing with each other and they know what the strengths are they know i mean even simple things like just moving the ball around at the back they now know kind of when when to give Dubravka the ball and i think mm. The one thing I would say Dubravka's got over Pope, I, I think Pope's a better shot stopper, but I think Dubravka is more willing to have the ball at his feet. I think you see Pope in yeah. that situation, he, he panics and kicks yeah. the ball out for <laughs> throw-ins. Or if he's tactically against Milan, he does the same thing five times. PSG, PSG. Up, PSG. Up, <laughs> but um, I, th- I think Dubravka's more willing to to kind of invite teams onto him and, and then play the balls, and that can put you into positions where we, we can kind of move, move the ball out and take advantage of that. But I just think, and, and kind of to pull Burnley on that point, though, I think... What we saw was finally we've, we've got a settled back five. And yes, we've all had um, times this season where we've been critical of, of individuals and we've maybe said certain players need to come in. I mean, obviously Tino has been talked about playing left back for a lot, but I think Byrne last night, was that was a really good game for him. He physically imposed himself on on that Fulham side last night. He won a lot of headers. He was just kind of bullying them almost, using what his, his strengths are. And um, I thought that was really positive. And, and you're right, Dubravka, what, when, when he was called upon, made, made the saves he needed to do. Wasn't a load, and that's that's great. Um, and I think that's a 
complement to the midfield and, and the defence that he didn't have a huge amount to do. But um, you, that's what you need from your kit. You need to just be there when, when, when called upon. So, yeah, that unit for me is probably the most pleasing thing. And I think there's a lot of good good coming out from the last few games. And um, I think that's only going to get stronger. And, and once the confidence starts to build, I think we'll start to kind of be putting things together and you'll not see as much of the sloppiness that we did at the beginning of kind of passing the ball out and stuff like that. I think that you saw the best and kind of not the worst of Dubravka, but yesterday, good saves, calm under pressure, decent with his feet, like you say, good relationship uh, with the back four in front of him. When Fulham were trying those balls and behind and Sven Botman's doing those recovery runs, that would normally be Nick Pope territory. And I think mm. that's the real imbalance that you see with Dubravka is that Pope is, yeah, he's not great with his feet, but he's so good off his line. Mm-hmm. He's been a sweeper keeper. And it, it means that we have to drop back a little bit. Like you said earlier, possibly one of your Charlotte said that the space between Isak and the, the midfields is so big because we have to defend a little bit deeper because the defenders know Dubravka is probably not going to leave his penalty area. That is still an issue, and that might be tested a lot more against Villa. Pope, back February, maybe, maybe March, so it's not too long, but definitely your point is excellent, Sai. Going into January after Forest, people were saying they need a goalkeeper. They need to go and get a goalkeeper in January. That was incorrect, and Dubravka has been probably the player of the month, to be mm. honest with you, apart from Isak, maybe, but re- you know, really, really good. Um, the other thing is so Newcastle kind of struggle in that respect until Pope comes back. You saw yesterday uh, in the first half the the kind of one really bad just waltz through the middle of the team moment from one of Fulham's lads who gets the edge of the box and Pereira, I think sh- yeah, yeah shanks it or whatever. But that that's the Miley issue that we'll have, and that's where a team like Villa might might really um, harm us. It's that we re- rely on a physicality and a physical as- uh, presence in midfield. Uh, to A, stop teams doing that, but also be able to turn the ball over quickly. So if you want to carry the ball 20 yards further forward, one of our lads is going to take it off you. And then we're in. Miley's been great. And technically on the ball, he doesn't look out of place, but he he struggles physically, which you'd expect of a 17-year-old. And I think that what he needs to do is be more willing to foul. I think he's just got to start fouling lads more clip them back you might get a booking and then and therefore you're you're, you're on a tightrope but considering Bruno can't can't make tackles essentially because he's one game away from a two game ban when we need him to play um I think that's one of the big areas to try and improve from last night in midfield assuming Willock isn't going to be back because Willock will come into that position uh, and assuming also we don't sign someone which I, I hope is a false assumption because we really need a physical player in midfield to help out with the the absence of Joe Linton um it's that's one thing I saw yesterday it's like you know, I think his teammates, minus teammates, have to get round him then, get in his ear and say, just bring him down. Just bring him down. You might not get booked. If, you, if you're right side of him and he's past you, stick a leg out. That's what good players do. They'll commit three, four niggly fouls and, and my, it's just not there yet for Miley. You see him You see him almost do it. You see him think about it. Th- I think you can see him think about it, but he just doesn't have the confidence. And he, 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 like you say, he's not phys- He's a 17 year old boy. Like he's, he's doing very well, but he's, he's not, he doesn't have that physical presence and he, and he sort of. He, he just pulls himself back whenever that opportunity presents itself. It, it's an experience thing, isn't it? I mean, we've, yeah. we've seen a lot of the Newcastle players, like, um, reticent to want to cr- commit a foul. I mean, I think, was it, um, I think Longstaff done it this season, uh, Isak and, and Bruno, I think, um, for, for one of the goals this season, I can't remember, but... It, Milan. It, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was the Milan, wasn't it? And you just think, <laughs> for fuck's sake, lads, like, how a man just, just beat, like, the big compliment you gave that in Newcastle last year was the shithousery and how... We, we didn't like blink at a moment to, to kind of do something that would frustrate other teams. And we seem to have lost that a little bit and that um, maybe it is because of the personnel and you're right. And it, I think it's hard to get on um, Miley a bit because as you say, he's, he's 17, he's, mm. he's not used to playing at this level. That is something that will grow. I mean, you look at any of the good players that it's not like they instinctively do it. And I think he's want, not wanting to, he's, he's looking at a situation where who the fuck comes in for him if he <laughs> gets, gets a, Sent off, or yeah. we need to rotate. Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 a it's a hard situation to be in. I, I kind of wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't want to be uh, in in that situation, especially when you've got Bruno, who it is known to just hoy in a ridiculous slide mm-hmm. tackle from sitting nowhere and, and but got himself in trouble. Can't because he's yeah. can't. Yeah, that's that's the problem. With Bruno he's got like another image. month. Yeah, and well, no, like another six weeks to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting booked. It's but I, I think you you you're right. There is a the, there's there's certainly things that we can learn, and, and that's my point in terms of I kind of jointly said that the six and seven choice, whatever. But like. I, th- I think it's there's a lot of learning this team's had to do because of the changing in personnel and that's all the units, the back, the, the middle midfield, 
Um, but you can see now we're starting to play together and, and the fact that they've had opportunities to do some training sessions, I think you can see there's been improvements since we've had, how it's talked about kind of having opportunities to work on things. You can immediately see last night that there's some things that they've clearly worked on that is, and, and some of it might be kind of trial and error from, from, um, from how in terms of seeing will, will this work. So um, I think we're only going to get better. I've got full faith in kind of everybody um, to, to keep building and start things going in the right way. And we've, we've done this before where we've had kind of bad patches and then mm. we turn it around and, and kind of there's a lot of good come. So um, you've just got to keep that kind of positivity going. And, and that was a perfect result last night. There's a lot of things, a lot of positives to take out of that. So um, yeah, it was a good performance in that respect. Just just to finish on Miley, sorry, um, I thought at 2-0, he started to look comfortable again. He started to do a lot mm. more on the ball. I think he's, he's lost a bit of confidence with the way all the results have gone in recent weeks. But yeah, he absolutely needs to get in the same gym that Elliot Anderson was in mm. all summer and just, just bulk <laughs> out. Um, he does bounce off of the players. When he, when he tries to put in tackles, he just sort of bounces off them and it has almost no impact. So he does, he just needs to half. He's only got one yellow card this season at Liverpool, which I can't remember. I don't know if it was just well, for Dick and Never a yellow card. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was ridiculous. Um, he does need to, to try that, but um, I, I don't mind that he's, <laughs> he is what he is. He, he's our, he's our tidy player. I think Bruno and Longstaff have to do all the, the work in that respect when we've got no Jill Linton, when we've got no Willicker or, or Anderson or anyone else. Um, you do, all three midfielders might not always have that, uh, but they need to compensate for that. Like you say, we need we need those players to, to step up a bit more. And yeah, Longstaff, who's played, I don't know, 150 Premier League games now, should have it in his locker to to, to be the bully uh, as opposed to Miley and, and stick up for him a little bit. Um, so I think the other lads, albeit Bruno Kahn, as we've just mentioned, but yeah, uh, it, it'll come. I think that'll come in his game. He just needs, uh, he's, he's too nice. He's, he's a really nice boy and he needs to like be a little bit nastier. This team is good at being nasty when they need to be. Give, give him a, like, a bonus for yellow cards or something. Get that in. <laughs> That's probably it. He's, he's probably scared about getting a fine and it's like half his wages if he gets a yellow card or something. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Hopefully this Fulham away win can have the same catalyzing effect as Fulham away did last season when we won 4-1 at their place and went on a crazy run of victories. Let's see. Starting with Villa on Tuesday. Quick reminder again, we have a live show, Gosforth Civic Theatre, 16th of February. T- uh, link in the description to this podcast tickets still available thanks to charlotte si and ben we'll be back very late on tuesday night because it's a friggin 8 15 kickoff <laughs> speak to you all then bye-bye this podcast is brought to you by aspers casino newcastle home of the four pound pint on match day that's all newcastle home games and any televised newcastle fixture the offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers be gamble aware over 18s only Visit BeGambleAware.org. Uh, be drink aware and for details and T's and C's, visit AspersNewcastle.co.uk.